I have this talk divided into what I call the preamble, a main story, and the postscriptum. And the preamble is going to be uh, kind of formal and theoretical. I didn't think really of putting it in this presentation until I saw Monday's talks. And I think it's appropriate, even if it is less connected to the phenomenology that is main focus of, of at least the first half of this workshop, um, I still think it's, uh, it's appropriate first to give a setting, motivate some of the systems I will be considering, and in general also address some questions that are being uh, discussed a lot in the literature over the last couple of years. Then I will go to, into the main story that is actually odd tensor modes for inflation. This will be part related to uh, CMB anomalies. Uh, no, this is a workshop on CMB anomalies. This will be about anomalies that we have not seen. <laughs> it's, uh, the, the, the goal, the main part of that, of that, talk, of that part of the talk is just to, to show that there are possibilities out there of things that our friend experimenters should measure and that might be a window towards interesting physics during inflation. And then I will have a final part uh, on magnetogenesis. We heard a little bit about magnetic fields. Uh, you know, we heard a lot about vector fields, but in this case I will care about a very specific vector field that is the uh, electromagnetic field, the one that we certainly know that exists. And, um, and so this would be the postscriptum part, and you know, I hope you will still be awake by the time I, I, I get there. Um, also, you know, uh, there will be some overlappings with material covered by Marco and Marizuka in particular um, in the first two days. But I hope I will be able to, you know, give the presentation a different, different point of view so that, you know, you could see the same argument also from different, different um, perspectives. So, preamble. Preamble is going to be about something very theoretical, very formal, and uh, I wanted to start, I always like to start very gently, this kind of talks, talking about inflation, and uh, because I think it's good to remind, well, to students, but also to ourselves, why we care about inflation, okay? So let me start with uh, five interesting facts about our universe, and basically these are all the facts that we know that concern the overall geometry of the universe. So the first thing we know is that the universe is a very old place, and it's a very big place. I mean, it's old for human time, like, uh, time scales, and time scales, human time scales are long in terms of particle physics time scales. So the universe is very, very old, okay? And, you know, it's also very, very uh, large because the speed of light is finite. In first approximation, it's homogeneous and isotropic. And uh, also, in first approximation, uh, and actually even in, uh, it's, uh, it's approximately flat, and by now this statement of the spatial flatness of the universe is verified at the percent level. So it's, it's, it's strong. This is a strong and important fact. Um, also, we know that structure, the structure we, we live in, so galaxies, stars, uh, clusters of galaxies, grow out of small quasi-scale invariant perturbations. And uh, as Planck has confirmed very nicely, those perturbations are very, very Gaussian to a degree of at least now a part in, in 1,000 or even less than that. So this is basically, as long as we don't go uh, and talk about the uh, actual content of the universe, you know, are there neutrinos, baryons, etc. This is basically all we know about the geometry of the universe. And it's quite impressive to discover that all these things can be explained by inflation, okay? The reason, again, why I, I wanted to show that slide first is that usually inflation is praised as the origin of scale invariant, uh, Gaussian perturbations, but we forget about the first things that inflation does for us. It does, it creates a universe that is large, flat, and that can live until now without collapsing into a bunch of black holes. So, well, we, we know what is inflation by now, period of accelerated expansion, this is just to be self-consistency, uh, self-consistent, the scale factor of the universe, we want the scale factor of the universe to be almost constant during inflation, 
And this, however, because of Friedman equation, the scale factor, the, sorry, the, the double parameter is proportional to the energy density. So we need to have a period in which the energy density of matter stays almost constant despite expansion. And usually this is difficult to achieve because ordinary matter dilutes with expansion. Um, so how do we get slowly diluting matter? We really don't know. But what we always or almost always do is to assume that there is some scalar field with some potential. And you know, I, I'm still saying things that for most of you are trivialities, but this will be important for what is coming up. Um, with a potential that has to be flat in order to induce accelerated expansion, precisely because if it is flat, the field can roll by a certain amount and still the energy density doesn't change a lot. And also we want inflation to last for sufficiently long time so that you know, just having first derivative equal to zero like here is not enough because if I have first derivative equal to zero but then I fall down very quickly down here, then inflation will not last for long. So I want also the second derivative to be much smaller than uh, very small. And the units are important. The first derivative of the scalar potential to be smaller than the, than the potential itself in units of the Planck mass. Same with the second one. These are the so-called slow roll conditions. Okay? So in principle, I take any theory, I, I, I ask somebody to draw a scalar potential on the wall, and have some point where the scalar potential satisfies these conditions, and I have a model of inflation. And you know, we could have been done with it. However, there is also one thing called quantum mechanics. And uh, whenever I write down a potential or a Lagrangian, for, let's say for a scalar field, I have to also to take into account quantum effects. And whatever I write at the classical level will be corrected by quantum effects. And what we need to make sure is that those quantum effects don't spoil the flatness of the potential that I wrote in the first place. Okay? So this is a very general, words-only problem. I'm not making any quantitative statement other than saying that there are corrections that we cannot a priori control in general, and that in general will spoil the flatness of my potential. The problem then is that our theory is not predictive anymore. Maybe, maybe those corrections conspire to give some new flat region of the potential. But we, unless we are able to compute all of them, we don't really know what to do. And what we like to do always is to have you know, a, a, a classical theory with small corrections that we can control. So in particular, there are models of so-called large field inflation that are models for which the inflaton field when it moves, uh, spans a space in field spaces that is all the order of the Planck mass. This sign means that for me, you know, even if the field spans like a half Planck mass, it's already large field inflation. Now, as long as it is not 10, 10 to minus 5 Planck mass, it, it is large field inflation. And one might have a possible concern that has been in the literature, in and out, that is potentially graviton loops are controlled by the scale of gravity, that is Planck mass, and they might generate corrections to the potential of this form. Now, if I have all these corrections and I add them in a Taylor series, as long as phi over Planck mass is sufficiently small, this is fine. But if phi is changing by more than a Planck mass, then I'm having a Taylor series with typically order one coefficients in which the variable in which I'm expanding is also order one. And this means that I cannot control the Taylor series anymore. I have to resum it. And if nobody tells me how to resum it, then I'm screwed. I cannot do calculations. Okay? So that was an important concern. Why should we care? Well, we care because uh, there's in, in simple models of inflation that are single field inflation models, there is one bound known as the light bound that says that the change, the span of the field in field space is of the order of Planck mass times square root of r divided by 0.01. So what's r? r is the tensor to scalar ratio, is, an, um, is a measure of how many gravitational waves are produced during inflation, and we'll talk a lot about gravitational waves later on. And uh, for the time being, this number is not being measured as a non-zero quantity. We have only an upper bound. The current 
constraints are of the order of 0.05. Uh, in three years, I, I see talks that tell me that in three years this will go down to 0.01. Um, I'm not sure whether everybody agrees on that, but the main thing is that this number here is still constrained to be of the order of the unity. Okay? And if future, future experiments measure uh, are different from zero, most probably this delta phi will be of the order of plug mass. So now we have a connection also with, with experiment. If experiment measures large gravitational waves from inflation, then we would have this problem. And again, I reformulate the problem again, one might have the concern that we cannot write a model of inflation in which we can control everything and then we have to throw our hands up. Sorry. Yes. It's based on words. In this case, it's not semi-classical. So uh, when do you say that quantum corrections are going to spoil the, yeah. the, the classical evolution? What do you mean by quantum here? Oh, loops of gravitons. But then, then you're talking about which is semi-classical quantization or something like this, right? Yeah, I guess. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, let, let me go ahead. I, I, I will point out that it, it has to be wrong, actually. Uh, this is why I said a possible concern. But um, it, it has to be wrong even in the context of the unknowns of quantum gravity. Okay? As long as we believe in some form of equivalence principle, it has to be wrong. And this is actually probably I should have had this coming up one second ago. Not really, okay? Um, so th what's the point? The point is that gravity, or at least perturbative quantum gravity, doesn't interact with phi. It interacts with energy. It doesn't really care about the value of phi. So it's not going to generate corrections that depend on phi. Okay? Gravity in general doesn't know about fields. It knows only about t mu nu. So the first correction that will appear are corrections that depend on the energy of phi, that is v of phi, or on combinations of kinetic terms and uh, uh, of phi, so momentum, that eventually gives derivatives of the potential. Okay? And this was actually calculated, of course, given what we don't know about quantum gravity, you know, there are numbers here that we cannot calculate. Okay? And this was first calculated by Smolin in 1980. Uh, but, you know, Linde in 1998 already, 1998 already pointed out that if this is a concern, then we shouldn't worry because the first effects from perturbative quantum gravity are of this form. And both these terms are always much smaller than the potential. In particular, if you are in slower regime, remember that v second is small, so this is a small correction to the potential. V is always smaller than Planck mass to the fourth, so this is also small. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, but that's, that's the potential, yeah? Yeah, this is the potential V of phi. Yeah. So, what you say is the potential much smaller than Planck mass? Exactly. I'm, uh, of, of, yeah. Clearly, I'm requiring that the energy density is smaller than Planck, Planckian energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so this, this is the result of a calculation. Where, and these are really words. Okay? Now, where does mathematically this protection, pr protection come from? It comes from the fact that if I take V of phi, phi exactly equal to a constant, the theory has a shift symmetry. That is, the theory is invariant under phi goes to phi plus a constant. Okay? Since the theory is invariant under phi goes to phi plus a constant, quantum corrections must respect the symmetry. Okay? So all quantum corrections cannot generate stuff that depends on phi non-trivially. At most, they can add the constant to the cosmological constant. It turns out, and that's on the other hand, it's a fact of life, that if I now, instead of having a potential that is perfectly flat, I have a deformed potential, the shift symmetry is broken, but it's broken in what we call a soft way. And the soft breaking means that it's broken in such a way that quantum effects don't break it more. Okay. In other words, the scale, you know, the amount of breaking of symmetry, we can measure by any quantity. Let's call it epsilon. 
all quantum effects will be proportional to epsilon in such a way that if epsilon goes to zero, then this goes to zero. Okay, simplest example, epsilon is just m squared. You take potential m squared phi squared. If you send m to zero, then you are guaranteed that the potential goes to zero and it's, sta it's, uh, it's stable under uh, all corrections because there is a shift symmetry. Okay. So, uh, so one could say, okay, we are done. You know, I write down any potential. It's stable under the perturbative quantum gravity correction. And this is true. If I wanted to have a model of inflation that is stable under radiative correction, all I can do is just write any potential I like, provided it has a flat region. I don't couple it to anything other than gravity, and I'm safe. Of course, however, we want to go ahead. And one thing we want to do typically is to reheat the universe at the end of inflation, and we want to couple the inflaton to matter. So what are couplings that break the shift symmetry in a hard way? Well, the main one is the Yukawa coupling. If I have five psi bar psi, then this is going to generate, as we know from standard model particle physics, is going to generate a correction to the mass that is quadratic in the cutoff of the theory. So if I have lambda five psi bar psi, I'm going to get a correction to the mass that is lambda square, Planck mass squared. And if lambda is larger than, what, 10 to minus 6, then this is already too large and my theory is out of control. So we are being a little bit more ambitious, but can we find a solution? So we are a bit more ambitious because we want now to couple the inflaton to matter. Is there a solution? Well, the solution is simple. Just now, instead of just saying that there was a shift symmetry, now declare that you want to have a shift symmetry. So you start with the Lagrangian where there is a scalar field that has to be shift symmetri symmetric. Automatically, Yukawa couplings are forbidden. Then you can break the shift symmetry a bit. We have to break the shift symmetry a bit because if the shift symmetry is exact, the potential is perfectly flat and nothing happens. And we, know we need to have a slope. And we generate a potential. And what we find is what we call a pseudo number Goldstone boson field. So I will have a, an important example. Um, so suppose that phi, the field phi, is actually the phase of some complex field. Then the shift symmetry is actually the U1 global symmetry of that complex field. Phi goes to phi plus a constant, corresponds to the complex field, going to the complex field E to the I alpha. So let me write down my favorite Lagrangian. I take a complex field, H, suggestively called H, or now also uh, B-E-H field, Brown and Glare Higgs field, um, and write it with the maximum head potential. This theory clearly has a global U1, okay? H goes to H e to the A alpha is a symmetry of the theory. And what I do, I do what I learned uh, in, uh, in kindergarten, that is to decompose the field H into its vacuum expectation value, a radial fluctuation, and an angular fluctuation. And I give dimensions phi of mass, so I divide by V. But that's out just of dimensional analysis. And what I discover is that delta H is a massive field. I forget about it. It's heavy. And phi is a massless Goldstone boson. And what is important for me is that this guy is a pseudoscalar. Okay? This will carry on for the rest of the talk. Um, at this level, this is a massless field, so it has no potential. Now, how can I generate a potential for phi? Well, I can break the symmetry, global symmetry. For instance, adding a term generated by any strong dynamics, and this is, again, you know, magic words to mean I put there anything I like. You know, it can be, again, gravitational instantons, can be stronger dynamics in some, in some gauge sector. In general, stuff that violates the global symmetry. The first term that I can write that violates the global U1 symmetry is of the form of some scale lambda that controls the breaking of the symmetry times H plus H star. It has to be real because it's a Lagrangian, but this is clearly breaking the symmetry. H goes to H to the I alpha. And so now I put this decomposition here. I put delta H to zero, and I discover that I now I generate a potential delta V that is given by this expression with cosine. So this is, this is interesting. Usually, you don't expect to find cosines. You know, usually write Lagrangians and lambda phi to the four. But in this case, actually, we are identifying the appropriate degree of freedom that is the one that is radiatively stable under corrections, 
where I'm breaking the shift symmetry, that is the global U1, by this amount, and I'm guaranteed that um, all loop corrections will not break this shift symmetry more than this amount. Okay? So at most, loop corrections will generate other terms that are of the same order of magnitude. I will discuss this in a second. But in general, they are actually expected to be much smaller. Also notice that I had a global U1, phi goes to phi plus a constant. There is a rem remaining symmetry, phi goes to phi plus 2 pi V, that is still a global exact symmetry. Um, so now, it, this was an ambiguous boson. This is a pseudo ambiguous boson because the symmetry is not exact. And this is why we call it pseudo. But also remember, pseudo scalar, okay? This will be the rest of. And you know, this was probably one of the first papers where people, if not the first, where people worried about naturalness conditions for the inflaton potential. It was a paper by Fries and collaborator, 1990, where they wrote down this model for natural inflation, and they wrote down a cosine potential, okay? Um, so I have a potential of this form, and if f is large enough, as we will see, this potential is stretched enough that this region is very flat, and you can have inflation here. Okay, and uh, given the argument of symmetries I, I said before, I'm basically guaranteed that it's stable under radiative corrections. Okay. Um, Take note of this parameter f. We will talk about it quite a bit. Um, OK, data. This is an old paper. Uh, I'm sorry for the Planck people. This is a paper that uses WMAP results. Uh, <laughs> but I still found that this picture is, is, uh, is it has the information I care about. This is a paper on the you know, famous space of spectral index versus tensor to scalar ratio in models of inflation. And these are the predictions of natural inflation. Natural inflation has two parameters, the height of the potential and f. You can trade one for the other using imposing Cobin normalization. You're left with a single parameter. Uh, along this, this lines, uh, you know, this corresponds to 40 foldings of inflation, 50 foldings of inflation, 60, 70 foldings of inflation. Along this direction, I'm changing the value of the parameter f. And this is 2.5 f's in units of Planck mass, 3.5. This was with WMAP3. And with WMAP3, you were already forced at 2 sigma to have f larger than 3.5 Planck masses. With the current Planck results, we are actually here. And f has to be larger than about 5 Planck masses. Okay. But incidentally, this is particle physics. Planck mass is the reduced Planck mass. It's 2.8, uh, 2.4, 10, 10, 10 to 18 GeV. OK, why should I care about this? Well, I will tell you in a second. So if I'm happy with an effective theory behavior in which I'm considering some form of loop quantum gravity, and I don't want to embed this in any more UV complete theory, Again, my talk would be over, or at least this part of the talk would be over. But let's try to be even more ambitious, and let's try to embed this into, let's say, string theory, or you know, any UV complete theory that hopes to in include gravity. Any? <laughs> any. Uh, I, I, any. But that's a good point. I, it's good. I, I will, I, now I will have to explain this to better. Uh, but in particular, you know, in, in string theory, uh, for any theory, I don't know, but in string theory, things look even better because in string theory, there's a lot of axioms. So you would say, you know, I have a lot of choice. Maybe one of those does the job. Uh, if it is any theory, maybe it doesn't have any axiom, then I'm in trouble. But, but the problem is that string theory, and uh, it's argued in this second paper, any UV complete theory of gravity requires F smaller than Planck mass. And remember that f has to be larger than five Planck masses by observation. So what, when was this done? So there was a first paper, as far as I know, by Bank, Dine, Fox, and Gorbatov in 2003 that, um, that were looking for this in string, string theory. And you know, as good th string theorists, what they did, well, they are very smart. They work very hard. They don't find any. <laughs> so it's impossible. Um, these guys, Arkani Ahmed, Motol, Nicolis, and Vatha, actually 
uh, lifted this to a conjecture true for any UV complete consistent theory of gravity. They had, this is a paper where they argue that gravity has to be the weakest force. Uh, they use some black hole evaporation paradox to argue that if you have charged particles with a mass, their charge is always to be larger than the mass in units of Planck mass. And then they do one further leap of faith and go into axions and assuming that axions are the particles charged and, uh, uh, sorry, are, um, yeah, particles charged, uh, uh, sorry, um, corresponding, the corresponding particles are uh, um, instantons, whatever, okay. And they, they say that this conjecture implies this condition. And this is true, this is supposed to be true for any UV complete theory of gravity. But it's still a conjecture. It's a conjecture. And the conjecture, you know, the, the argument for, and it's, it's a conjecture squared if you want. It's first, the, the first conjecture that I, makes sense, some sense, is the following, is just that gravity has to be the weakest force. Their argument is if I have a black hole that is charged, it's gonna evaporate and it's gonna discharge by Schwinger per production. If it is discharging more slowly, if it's losing charge more slowly than it's choosing, losing mass, this means part, particles are, have a large mass and a small charge, then you, at some point, you will end up with an extremal uh, black hole that has maximal charge for what is allowed, and that thing is stable. And there were, uh, you know, papers in the 90s that were saying that these stable remnants are a problem because there would be too many of those in the universe and they would run into loops and would lead to some big catastrophe. So, and this, you see, this has nothing to do with string theory. Now, that's the first conjecture. It's a conjecture squared because then they do some dual transformation, changing dimensions and saying that whatever holds for charge, electric charge and, and mass, also, also for instantons and F. Um, and more recently, there were other papers working on this, and the main argument, uh, so to see what goes wrong other than this, you know, fundamental conjecture that is in this case, what goes wrong is typically that uh, an instant, of, and now we are going to the non-perturbative gravity effect, so if you didn't, you know, you're not even sure about the perturbative for, you know, this is also very conjectural, but still, let's try to take it seriously, if you want. The, the main point is that you have gravitational instantons that are, uh, contribute the, poten the potential in the form of cosine of n phi over f, so higher harmonic of the, of the potential, and is suppressed by e to the minus n, this n is this n, n Planck over f. So you see, if f is smaller than n Planck, all the terms with n larger than one are gonna be exponentially suppressed. And so we are left only with the first harmonic. But if f is, small, is larger than Planck mass, then the first uh, F over, over M Planck terms are not going to be suppressed by this exponential. And so they all come with equal coefficients. And now your potential is not just cosine of phi, but it's cosine of phi plus order one cosine of two phi plus order one cosine of three phi plus order one cosine of four phi. And all these order one numbers are not predictable and you don't know what to do. Again, you see, however, how ambitious I am. Okay, I want to have inflation, I want to couple it to matter, I want to put it in a UV complete theory of gravity, and I want to take seriously gravitational instantons. If I want to stop at any point below this, I'm safe. So it just proves that it's assuming that the dilute instant time approximation has to be valid. And if, it, if it doesn't, then the universe is impossible. Exactly. Beautiful. That's a, that's a very nice way of putting it. So, are there ways out? So cosine of phi over f in this context is not good. Are there ways out? The, and of course, people consider the bunch. And you know, our speaker, uh, well, my esteemed chair, uh, I, I think it deserves uh, for sure the praise of First, writing a, a, having a very smart idea about how dealing with this, and second, as far as I know, being the first one who actually cared about this problem and tried to solve it. Um, and what they did was just to use two axioms 
and fine tune the Fs of the two axioms in such a way that you get the flat direction by some fine tuning. Um, later on, Dimopoulos Savas, uh, in this case, and collaborators considered many of these guys to work together in a mechanism of assisted inflation. Uh, more recently, there was a paper, well, in 2008, there was a very successful idea by Silverstein and Westphal to use monodromy. Monodromy means that even if phi is an angle, and so the potential is not periodic. So the potential is a multi-valued function of the angle. And so this is why I'm having this plot, phi, this is the range of variation of phi, and the potential has different branches, and you can go from here to here to here, and still going up, 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 so that the potential, uh, you, don't, you are not limited to have a smaller than Planck mass range of variation of the field, and still, you still go up in your potential. And uh, I had to advertise at least uh, a, a paper with Nemanja Kaloper, which we obtained. This is that actually this plot is from this paper. Uh, by mixing a, a pseudoscalar with a four form. So the bottom line, and this is the end of my long preamble. Uh, when did we start, Mr. Chairman? So, Three minutes ago. 31 minutes. Oh my god, OK. <laughs> so this was long. Uh, the main thing is that we have theoretical motivations to like pseudoscalar inflatons better than scalar inflatons. Okay? Um, even if we didn't have, you know, a field is either scalar or pseudoscalar. So 50% of cases is, is pseudoscalar. Um, you know, it's like either I play, when I play the lottery, either I win or I lose. Okay? 50%. Um, so, so uh, I, I hope I, uh, so the first message I want to go through is that there is people that care about this radiative stability and uh, I think by now we have a very nice consistent picture of what's going on that points from a theoretical prejudice point of view a lot to pseudoscalar inflatons. And this is why I started working on what can be the phenomenology of pseudoscalar inflaton. The first thing is it's pseudoscalar violates parity. What can we see with it? And this brings me to the last, next part of the talk. Sorry. Yes. Yes. The, the second one is, is what is called inflation, right? Inflation, yes. It's really assisted inflation. Assisted. assisted inflation is, you know, you have many fields all rolling together, but it's a radiatively stable, you know, the original assisted inflation is the problem that wasn't stable against radiative correction. This is by construction. So now, now the, main, the main part of the story, odd tensor modes for inflation, and this is, was intended to be a pan, uh, odd, both in the sense of parity odd, but also in the terms of strange, okay? So I will talk about tensor modes that are odd in the sense of parity violating, but also that have other funny properties like non-Gaussianities. They can be directly detectable. They have a blue spectrum. Uh, this part, I will, well, I will go a bit faster probably also because it was partially covered by Mark and Marisuke. Um, so, but let me go ahead again with motivation. One motivation I said was just what are the potential phenomenological implications of a pseudoscalar inflaton? The other question, the other motivation for me was the following. You know, every time I read a paper on inflation or model building in inflation, you have like 20 pages of big theoretical motivations followed by 10 pages of phenomenological implications, you know, features in the potential, isocurvature modes, oscillations in the spectrum, uh, starting with non-vacuum states. And then you have this very sad, lonely, chapter of like a third of a page. And by the way, we compute the Hubble parameter during inflation is such and such, and this gives us that the tensor mode are such and such, period. So the general prediction is always that all you do is you comp compute the Hubble parameter during inflation. The amplitude of gravitational waves produced during inflation is proportional to h squared over mp squared. And you have a slightly red spectrum because h squared is decreasing, period. So the one other goal of this talk is to talk about tensors that are not boring. Um, so as I said, I will consider the following system that was already presented. A pseudoscalar rolling coupled to a U1 gauge field, phi over F. I, you know, Marco used alpha. In this case, I will just use F here. Remember this F now, given what I told about all the possible potential that we can construct with pseudoscalars now, this F doesn't need to be the F that appears in cosine of phi over F. 
I will assume a completely general V of uh, the potential for the inflaton. And so F will be just a constant of dimension of the mass that controls the coupling of phi to electromagnetic field. I go to Coulomb gauge, I decompose the vector field into helicity modes. And what I discover, well, what was already discovered on Monday, yes. Doesn't have to be a photon. For the time being, it's a U1. This is for the time being a, a, a U1 gauge field, and this phi field phi doesn't even need to be the inflaton. Okay? It will become the electromagnetic field in the last part of the talk if I have time. Okay. So this is what Mark already mentioned. Uh, you know, the equation of motion for the elicity lambda plus or minus mode have this form. So for lambda negative, for one of the two values of lambda, this whole quantity is negative. And so if k is sufficiently small, you have an exponential amplification of the mode function. You can solve the equations exactly, and one discovers, for instance, that one elicity only of the gauge field is amplified. Let's call it the left-handed, just to fix ideas. Of course, the fact that it's left or right-handed depends on the sign of phi prime. Um, and the amplitude is given by this expression. Notice that I had a parity violating background given by a rolling pseudoscalar. Now parity violation has been transferred to the gauge field because now we have only left-handed photons around and no right-handed photons. So my universe now knows about handedness. And it's an exponentially large amount of photons. Now these photons might be the U1 photons of electromagnetism. I will not want this to be the case for the time being. It's just photons that are hanging around during inflation. There's a lot of those. They're stationary. You're producing them, and they're diluting them at the same rate so that you have a kind of stationary bath of left-handed photons filling your universe. And these photons will interact with gravity and will be a source of gravitational waves. So what we do is write the equation of motion now for gravitational waves. Because while photons can go, gravitational waves are stuff that we can see. Uh, and so we have the standard equation for elicity lambda gravitational waves, but also a source. And what's the source? The source is given by the projection of elicity lambda modes of the spatial components of the stress energy tensor of the photon. What, what does this normally mean? Is it an operator equation? Um, this is an operator. This is a field. I'm treating this as operators, not as classical. Fields. I should uh, even co count them as classical fields, but it's, it's convenient to treat them as operators. So I'm quantizing the electromagnetic field, and I'm quantizing gravitons. Now, the right-hand side is known because I computed the mode functions of the photon before, so I can compute the left-hand side with the propagator. And uh, what I discover, I don't go into the details of the calculations, they are boring that the two-point function of the left-handed gravitons are different than the two-point function of the right-handed gravitons. Since everything is stationary, there's still going to be both scale invariant, but their overall amplitude is going to be different. And the physics with this is that if I have, now this is a two-to-one process. This will be important also in what follows. I'm two photons producing one graviton. And if the two photons are kind of collinear and they're both left-handed, the graviton by by conservation of angular momentum, will want to be left-handed. So this is, this is the kind of scattering that makes the difference, that makes, produces, have more production of left-handed than right-handed gravitons. And then one sits down and one computes, and eventually one gets the power spectrum of left-handed and right-handed gravitons that has two terms. The first one is the standard one. Forget about this part. h squared over pi squared. Usually we have a two, but it's the two comes from left-handed and right-handed. So one here and one here. Parity violation appears in this term here. The fact that these two numbers are different. Notice one, one question you always get is, well, where do these numbers come from? These numbers are numbers. You know, they, they are functions of pi, so square root of twos, etc. And for me, they are, again, this is good also, especially for the students, but also again for the older people in the room. These are a good warning against the temptation of putting 2 pi equal to 1 in your calculations, okay? Um, 
because you see the, the magnitude of the results, okay? And this, the, you know, the fact that these numbers are 10 to minus six will matter in the end. Um, they are different, so it's parity violation. I'm introducing this parameter Xi that you already are very familiar with. So phenomenology, how do we see this? Okay, now we have a universe that is, during inflation, is producing a spectrum of gravitational waves, some of which are left-handed, some of which are right-handed, but they are not in the same amount. Well, we don't see the gravitational waves. Well, we might one day, but what we look usually for are effects of gravitational waves on the CMB. And in the CMB, we know that we have amplitude fluctuations, temperature, but also electric and magnetic uh, polarization mode, E and B modes. And uh, this and these guys are even, and this is odd. So the correlator TB and EB average on the sky should be equal to zero as long as the CMB is uh, parity invariant. Or the other way around, if you have parity violation in the tensor sector, then you expect to see these guys to be different from zero. So what are the detection prospects for this? Well, we have not seen anything yet, um, but do we have any hope of seeing this? Um, they depend on two parameters. One is R, tensor to scalar ratio. Of course, if I don't see any gravitational waves, I cannot tell whether they're left or right. So R has to be large enough. And they depend on this quantity delta chi that is defined to be between minus one and one. That is telling you how much left-handed versus right-handed you have. So this plot is unreadable. No, readable. It's a plot from a paper from 2010 from Glushevich and Kamionkowski. On the x-axis, you have r. On the y-axis, you have one sigma on delta chi in various experiments. So let's take, let's take cosmic variance limited, you know, an ideal experiment. Suppose that r is 0.12, that is this vertical line that is kind of the current bound, more or less. Then one sigma error on delta chi is about 0.15. And this means that if, we, if, our, if uh, R is really 0.12, a cosmic variance limited experiment, if delta k is equal to one, will be able to detect parity violation at more or less six sigma. Okay. So, uh, but also look at Planck. Well, Planck is actually, th this was even too optimistic because then there are other issues about uh, calibration of the angles. But you know, in the experiments we are thinking about, this is gonna be very difficult. But in principle, it's not forbidden. Sorry again, the, the horizontal axis is R. R. So, you know, if you have a tensor to scalar ratio of order 0.1, then you see that the cosmic variance limited experiment might be able to detect uh, a fully chiral delta chi equal to one by a number of sigma that is one divided by this number that is about six, probably. You know, CMB pole is one divided by three, it's about three sigma. And Planck or spider, nothing. Okay. Um, incidentally, uh, where I, well, this I say, uh, I skip. There was a more recent paper by people in Paris doing a much more detailed analysis, but the final result is the same. A ground-based experiment is not gonna see any uh, EB or TB, thank you, yes. Uh, a CMB, a ground-based CMB experiment is not gonna be able to do this, but a satellite mission in ideal conditions might have a, a, a noise to, um, sorry, a signal to noise ratio of order five, five to six. Then it's gonna degrade, but still you, you might see something. Um, okay, so, Going back to the model, so hopefully we are not wasting completely our time, um, and maybe these things can actually be detected in an ideal world. Um, going back to the model, uh, in principle there's a large parity violation. Um, can we have anything more? And that's the next question, actually. Let me do this. Is there any extra phenomenology we can look for? And as we heard from Marizuke, the answer is yes. Um, as I said, photon source metric perturbation in a two-to-one process. Two photons produce one graviton. Photons are Gaussian. 
They are produced from amplification of vacuum fluctuation of a free field. So if I have, I convolve, convolve two, uh, well, if I take two Gaussians and put them together, I get a non-Gaussian field. So it turns out that uh, one can compute actually the three-point function of gravitons produced in this process, and uh, it turns out to be very non-Gaussian, let's say maximally non-Gaussian, in which sense? In the sense that the three-point function of the graviton is going to be proportional to the two-point function to the power three over two. That's as non-Gaussian as it can get. And uh, Yes. By, by just dimensional no analysis. Uh? There is either Gaussian or non-Gaussian. I don't see why. Sorry, I just, I just don't, I don't see how. Well, you can you can have a measure of deviation from Gaussian, right? I, I can I can think of a Gaussian. You know, I have e to the minus x square one plus epsilon x with epsilon really small, yeah. and that's a small deviation from yeah. Gaussian. But if I take a random, a random distribution, the, the, the third moment will be equal to the second moment to the three over two. Do the same with the fourth moment and the fifth moment? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I just didn't want to compute the fourth momentum. Okay. I expect the fourth momentum to be HH squared, the fifth momentum to be HH five over two. Yeah, at least still I can take it the, the scale and the, the units out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Scale free play, which, by the way, is not the way it's done it with FNL. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, FNL is, and you know. What you have is, uh, what's sort of implied in your slide is a lot more sensible if you want to put non Gaussianity into a dimensionless. Yeah, world. yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, you, you, you measure all momenta of your distribution in units of your original sigma. No, sigma is always defined, even for a non-Gaussian. You know, you have a variance for any distribution. You measure all the momenta in units of your variance. For a Gaussian signal, they are all given by a certain function. You know, the third momentum is zero. The fourth momentum is I don't remember how many sigma, etc. You unit, but in, and I'm just putting sigma equal to one here. And so in a general distribution, random distribution, you compute all momenta and they will be all of order one in units of your, uh, of your original sigma, the original dispersion. Um, okay, and Marizuke talked uh, a lot about this, so I, I will not go into detail. One other thing I have to mention, and this is, uh, was also mentioned by Marco, is that, is, so we have nice, beautiful effects in the tensor sector. What happens for the scalar sector? Scalar sector is very constrained by observations. Well, by the same reason why we are getting non-Gaussian tensors, we're gonna get non-Gaussian scalars. But we have very strong constraints on non-Gaussian scalars. And this was, you know, Marco and Neil's paper in 2010. And uh, what, what happens is that eventually, if phi is the inflaton, there is a strong coupling between the inflaton and the gauge field. The gauge field inf fluctuations infect the fluctuations of the inflaton with a, with a sick non-Gaussian component. And, uh, and uh, in order for this to be under control, you have to reduce the amplitude of the photons so much that they don't produce a lot of gravitational waves. And so we don't see parity violation in the CMB. End of the story. So in this simple scenario, parity violation is not detectable in the simplest model. So still, it's, it's a signature that is interesting and I think it's worth uh, you know, trying to see how much we have to work to convince observers to look for it, okay? So one possible and inelegant way is to consider many, many gauge fields. Suppose instead of having just one U1 gauge photon, I have N of those. Well then, you know, this, uh, the effect of these guys sums incoherently and it turns out that you have a one over square root of N effect. You know, some of these guys will contribute positively, some will contribute negatively, and eventually it turns out that FNL is suppressed by a factor of one over N. And so with an order of 10 to three to 10 to four gauge fields that is ridiculously large, I admit, uh, FNL stays safely small. It's ridiculously large, however, if for instance, I imagine a non-abelian gauge field that is very, very weakly coupled, then the number of gauge fields goes as the rank squared. 
and uh, you know you might laugh but I had to look you know I looked in the literature and there are people that write papers about string theory construction with SU 248 and <laughs> in which case you have the right amount of gauge photon bosom I, I am the first one that doesn't take it seriously but still okay um, so, but the main reason why I'm showing this is that it's not totally excluded and allows me to show this plot and I care about this plot. So this is a plot, uh, suppose that this is true, okay? This is a plot where I'm plotting uh, parameter spaces, Hubble parameter versus Xi, the parameter Xi, and below this line here, parity violation would be too small to be observable, okay? And this line corresponds to R equal to 0.2, famous number. Um, and you can see that there is a, 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 what looks like a, a small strip here of region that would have detectable parity violation. So in this scenario, there would be a part of parameter space. It looks a thin strip, but it's not because this is a log scale. Okay, so we have a factor of 10 here in Hubble parameter, at least more or less 10 going up. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out in this plot is that there is some room for observing this stuff, at least in principle. Second, more importantly, look, this is the line R equal to 0.2. And one thing I said at the beginning of the talk was that R is a measure of the Hubble parameter during inflation in standard models. Well, this is a scenario where actually there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between R and the Hubble parameter. The reason is that, uh, you know, in this part of the, in this regime, we are producing gravitational waves not by the standard amplification of vacuum fluctuation, by, but by these photons. So we are breaking the relationship between R and H. And this was sort of a, um, a, a hot topic in particular for people that were looking for, trying to do inflation in string theory because there was a, a, a claim that string theory would always have a Hubble parameter very low. So they were saying, if we observe gravitational waves, this will disprove string theory. And they were trying to see, well, what if we observe gravitational waves and still H is much smaller than, you know, the, the usual expected value? Well, this is an example where you could have H of order of, you know, 10 to minus 7 and still observe R of order 0.1. And this is also, well, yeah, this one over square root of n effect is also going to suppress that. Yes? When you, can you provide yep. this? How is this uh, window of uh, detection possible, possible detection changes when you take uh, more relevant values of R 0.1 rather than 0.2? Oh, good question. Doesn't change a lot. It, it doesn't go here. Okay. So when? It goes down. Well, it, it actually goes down. Yeah, it goes down as one over. That's a good question. It, it uh, probably should plot like 0 0.2 and 0 0.1. Doesn't it? Doesn't go. It doesn't close at 0 0.1. So what's the value at which it closes? We'll discuss about it later. Um, and when you expand it, you change the parameter space. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And the reason is that you're producing more gravitons than scalar perturbations because of helicity conservation. And this is why you have more non-Gaussianities in the tensor sector than in the scalar sector. Um, so the expectation was, that, as I said, to find a model with large non-Gaussian parity violating tensors and essentially sca scalar uh, the third stand standard. But in last fall, there was a very nice paper by uh, Martin Sloth and the student in which they pointed out that uh, calculation at horizon crossing wasn't enough. And in this case, since you have two field dynamics, you have to follow what happens afterwards. And there are some very nice miraculous, and so in other words, you have to take into account this term that is Planck mass suppressed. Here I put Planck mass equal to one that is actually suppressed by a lot of Planck masses. So, you know, we, we, we naturally thought this was negligible, but it's a mixing term. So what happens is that you're, yes, producing non-Gaussianities only in the sigma field, that is the one coupled to the photons, and the sigma field is not the inflaton, but over 60 foldings, those non-Gaussianities oscillate into the inflaton sector. That's the way I, I, I at least understand the story. Um, so what they found was that even if the field couple to the photons is not the inflaton, uh, there is this effect. And now I answer Patrick's uh, question. What they find is that, so assuming that delta n is the number of foldings during which sigma is rolling, sigma is a, an additional field during inflation, doesn't need to be rolling for 60 foldings. Okay? So you could think that you know, it rolls for a while, then it decays. Uh, they find that r has to be smaller for, uh, to have observable gravitational, uh, um, yeah, to have gravitational waves that are mostly sourced by the photons and not by just the vacuum fluctuations. You must add that R is of order few, I think it's like two or three, divided by the number of folding squared. So you see, if, if delta N is 30, then no hope. If delta N is five, then why not? Um, and an important note is also that for delta n much smaller than 60, and this is why I was asking questions about uh, scale-dependent on Gaussianities to Martin yesterday, uh, the effect uh, of non Gaussianities would be weaker because you would have a strongly scale-dependent non Gaussianities. And again, you know, from the phenomenological point of view, maybe this is a good one more potentially good reason to look at strongly scale-dependent FNL. Again, it's very easy for me to say this. Uh, I guess it's more difficult for people to actually compute these things. So conclusion of this part, I, I have time until 10.30 more or less, is that correct? You have 18 minutes. Perfect, perfect. So the, 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 the conclusion is that I think I, I gave an existence proof of a model that is, I believe, very strongly motivated to start with, you know, rolling pseudoscalar. And if you have a pseudoscalar, it will be coupled to photos with that, via that coupling. That will happen. The, the, the magnitude of F is a matter of discussion, uh, but it will be coupled to photons. So there will be, this effect will exist in the universe. Of course, the question is whether it is large enough. And, uh, this will give potential parity violation and potentially large tensor non Gaussianities with small scalar non Gaussianities. Um, short comment uh, this is worth, and uh, actually, I'm quoting a paper by one of our organizers here. One could ask the question, and I'm usually asked the question why don't do it with RR tilde instead of FF tilde? You know, you could have a direct coupling phi with Riemann tensor times the dual of the Riemann tensor. And, uh, you know, there was a paper by Leith and Jensen, and there was another paper by Sato that po pointed out that you have a problem in this case. Uh, if you compute the Lagrangian for the tensors, for the tensor modes in this case, uh, you, have a you have a coefficient here that depends on the helicity. So you quantize, and you see it depends, it has this time-dependent form, so you are quantizing the tensors with a time-dependent coefficient here, and that's the perfect way of producing particles or amplifying particles out of vacuum. You know, you quantize stuff with a time-dependent coefficient. Um, 
but you can see you are, this term multiplies the kinetic term. So for one of the helicities, this quantity goes negative at some point. And before it goes negative, it crosses zero. When it goes negative, this quantity is a ghost. If it is a ghost, the theory is totally inconsistent. It just means that, you know, whatever I wrote here is the first term of an expansion when I have to add extra terms that will cure whatever bad thing is happening there. Uh, and if I want to actually have observable parity violation, I have to have this thing cost too cl so close to zero that the theory is in any case strongly coupled and not trustable. So this doesn't work. The reason why FF tilde works and this doesn't is, is cute. FF tilde, F is a one derivative object, d mu a nu. So FF tilde is a two derivative object. But the Riemann tensor starts as a two derivative. So this is a four derivative thing. And this is why when I do FF tilde, you see, here I have this term here that has one derivative here, one derivative here, and two derivatives here. This is four derivatives. In the case of FF tilde, the same term multiplies just a mu, not the derivative of the, scalar, uh, of the vector field, but just the vector field because it's a two derivative object. So there you go. So this is why this cannot work. Um, I will skip this part because Mark already talked about it. Uh, just one thing. This, uh, actually, no, let me go back. I will skip it, but not all of it. Um, this quantity here, th this is the result I've shown before. This is the two-point function of the left-handed and right-handed gravitons. Xi during inflation is not constant. It's actually phi dot divided by FH. Phi dot increases and H decreases during inflation. So Xi is increasing over time. So this means that actually this power spectrum have a, has a dependence on momentum here. And when I plot it, I get this result that is what Marco was mentioning. And what I wanted to point out, not this, is that here the spectrum is blue. And this again is a simple counterexample of something we often hear that is the spectrum of gravitational waves has to be red unless you violate energy conditions. And of course, I, we are going around this no-go theorem because this is, not, uh, this is not gravitational waves produced from amplification of vacuum fluctuation, but it's produced by some other mechanism, in which case I can have perfectly legitimate blue spectra, and the theory is super healthy. Um, OK, any question here? Want to go to sleep already? <laughs> Should I start magnetic fields? About 15 minutes, right? 15. Oh, OK. So I will cover this. So magnetic fields, why do we care? Well, they are observed in the universe, apparently, with a number of techniques. This is by no means my specialty. So I'm reporting what I know. Uh, there's very solid evidence of magnetic fields in our galaxy. Uh, so coherence length of the order of kiloparsecs or tens of kiloparsecs amplitude of the order of micro gauss to have an idea micro gauss actually corresponds to an energy density that is the same of the cmb so those magnetic fields have in a, are actually in an equipartition of energy with cmb photons and also i think with charged plasma in the galaxy um, and they might have been originated from an amplification of a weaker seed field you start with a some initial magnetic field, you put a galaxy around it, the galaxy rotates, as it rotates and it has plasma, the field lines get whirl around with the galaxy, they disconnect, uh, reconnect, and they will reconnect, they are twice as strong. And so you have an effect of collapse of the galaxy that increases the magnetic field, plus this exponential instability called, uh, from this uh, mechanism called the, the dynamo. It is not still, I understand, completely understood. There's people that still claim that doesn't work at all, even. Um, there has been, about five years ago, a, an interesting uh, observation. Uh, well, people have argued that there are also magnetic fields in, in voids, so outside of galaxies, in which case they could not have been produced by any astrophysical mechanism. Um, 
and uh, their intensity depends on their, we, there's a bound on their intensity, there's about 10 to minus 17 Gauss times one megaparsec divided by the coherence length of the field to the one half. Okay, so short coherence length fields must be very strong. Uh, again, there is people that have also questioned this ob observation. I know a little bit more about this. I can talk about it later this after, well, one hour later if you want, but for the time being, I will just take this as face value. Uh, and the question is, of course, could these things come from inflation? So there were two, historically, two interesting mechanisms that don't break gauge symmetry. And we have heard from Marco that we don't like to break gauge symmetry. Uh, in, uh, that generate magnetic fields. The first is the RATRA mechanism, about which by now we are all in this room world experts, thanks to uh, Mindaugas talk here and Marco. Uh, 92. The other option that we are also by now very familiar with, uh, I hope I gave you a little bit of a reminder in the first part of my talk, is the possibility of an axion. Again, you have a pseudoscalar inflet on coupled to FF tilde. And, uh, and now, now F is really the electromagnetic U1 gauge field, okay? This was first hinted at in the original paper on ma cosmological magnetic fields by Turner and Woodrow, and it was studied in detail by Carol Fielder Garretson, and I will go back to that paper. Um, so magnetogenesis by Ratra, we heard already a lot about it, so we have just have one slide on it. Uh, it cannot work because either the theory is strongly coupled, or if it is weakly coupled, you have that either the electric field produced during inflation is too red, so you have a lot of infrared modes of the electric field that accumulate a lot of energy, and uh, they very quickly start back reacting on your background, and then you don't know what to do anymore. Or if I tune things in such a way that the electric field is not too red, then it turns out that the magnetic field is too blue. So the magnetic field has a lot of power at short scales, less power at large scales. We are measuring the magnetic fields at large scales. Of course, an answer would be you raise everything so that I have more power at large scales. In which case, however, uh, in the RATRA mechanism, there's only one scale that controls everything, that is the Hubble parameter, and the intensity of the magnetic field at Hubble radius is to be h square. So you cannot raise this. You are, you are pinned at small scales to have that amplitude, and then you have to go down because otherwise this will back react on you. And so you go down, down, down as you go to large scales and you lose a lot of power, and this doesn't work, period. Uh, Axial magnetogenesis, uh, well, I, I told you before how we compute a vector field. The vector field is proportional to e to the pi psi. This is, you know, my talk of half an hour ago. Hubble squared, and then one can compute the power spectrum of it, and this covers that it's very blue. It's gone as one over the lens squared. So, uh, the good uh, advantage of this with respect to the uh, RATRA model is that the overall amplitude is tunable because of this parameter psi, so that I can actually raise the field, the, the value of the field at small scales while keeping the, 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 the spectral index down, but the spectrum is very blue. And this was the conclusion of the paper by Carol Fielder Garrison in 92. If I even chose psi to saturate the condition of knockback reaction, you still don't want too much energy in the UV part now of the magnetic field. UV meaning Hubble scale uh, part of the magnetic field. Then at megaparsec scales, the magnetic field is too weak and you don't get anything. And uh, people took this paper seriously and nobody looked at this model anymore for 15 years. Until my student, and he, he, he must, you know, he has all of my credit. My first student, Mohammed, came into my office asking me, can I do some calculation? I told him, well, read, repeat the calculation by Carol Filler Garrison. He did the calculation very nicely. And then he came to me and said, oh, I found in the literature, they talk about this inverse cascade. I think it applies to us. So what's the inverse cascade? After, one thing that Carol and collaborators didn't take into account, actually back then nobody knew it, or almost, is the following. 
the magnetic field I have produced is has maximal helicity. It's only left-handed magnetic field, okay? So it has this quantity. Turns out that in the primordial plasma that has a very high conductivity, this quantity is basically constant. Now, in, in, uh, in uh, magnetohydrodynamics, so now I'm looking at what happens after the end of inflation, during reheating, during the radiation-dominated period, you have dissipative processes that suppress power at small scales. You know, stuff moves around and takes away magnetic field. But you have to conserve elasticity. And this means that the power has to go to lar larger scales. This was uh, detailed in these papers. And I think the best way of understanding what's going on is from this numerical simulation by the, the I think, the best paper or and the most readable paper on the subject by Yedansik and Banerjee. Uh, they have, this is an evolution of a magnetic field without elicity. It starts, you know, this is k space, so these are large scales, these are small scales. They start with the spectrum of this form, and then they evolve, and what they see is that there is dissipation here, some field leaks towards smaller scales, and at larger scales nothing happens. In presence of elicity, the same thing happens. The field leaks here, as it does here, but if we were just to have this phenomenon happening, the total elicity would change. What are the units of heat? <sighs> Numerics. This is in, uh, in uh, conformal, this is just a, a, you know, they don't have an expanding universe. You can rescale everything by a conformal factor. That's actually quite trivial to take into account in a radiation dominated universe. And then it's just numerics and, uh, you know, I don't know what are the units of K either. Um, and, but what they have is that, you know, if I were doing this, then I wouldn't conserve elicity. So in order to conserve elicity, the peak has to move out. And what they observed that was even more interesting was this property of self-similarity. The spectrum goes up. So you see the power at large scales is increasing. So this is actually helping. And uh, it turns out that uh, in our paper in 2006, we, have show, we had shown that axial magnetogenesis plus inverse cascade actually can change the result of the previous Carroll paper, Carroll Field and Garretson paper. And actually, you can have decent uh, generation of magnetic fields. But, yes? So the inverse cascade that's MHD turbulence? Or yes. Yes. It's, it's uh, you know, that is very simple. It, it's terribly complicated. You have periods of turbulence, periods of viscous, periods of turbulence again. It, it, it's, that's why I'm saying that paper is really difficult to read. But there is an overall simple scaling that they can get by basically dimensional analysis eventually. And it's just uh, based on, uh, you know, having turbulence, allowing you to have simple relationship within the, the, the flows of the plasma and the magnetic field. Emily, helicity is a quantity that's just an integral for the whole yes. system. Yes, yes, yeah, it it's global. Is it conserved if the flux lines aren't broke? The, if you have a finite conductivity or can you? No, it's not conserved for a finite conductivity. You know, that, that is one of the first thi f few things I really know about this. It's one over sigma. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, so everything was great. We can get magnetic fields. But then again, Marco comes and tells us again that, even <laughs> that the same model has a lot of constraints from non-Gaussianity is produced during inflation. It's the same model I was talking about before. And, and from this, no magnetic fields anymore, zero. You know, very small amount in this case. Uh, so axiom model for magnetogenesis is ruled out. So can we find a way out? And this was the subject of this work with Chiara Caprini last summer. So there are problems and ways out, hopefully. So what are the problems? The first problem was that, you see, RATRA was good because you could control the spectral index with RATRA, but you couldn't control the overall amplitude. And the axion is the other way around. You can compute a, control the overall amplitude, but the spectral index is fixed. So we use both of them at the same time. Also, how to evade Marco's problem, well, our problem due to Marco, 
I, I guess this is not the best way of making friends with your chairman, but... <laughs> By the way, you have two minutes. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> 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 well, uh, to solve Marco's problems, I use Marco's solution. Phi is not a inflaton. There's some other field rolling coupled to the gauge photo. So we have this Lagrangian where now you have f of t that multiplies both the kinetic term and the f of tilde term with this constant gamma that is a phenomenological constant. Uh, to make contact with all the previous notation, one can define the parameter xi that is the same psi as before, that is related to gamma by this relation. But you know, both gamma and psi are order one numbers, okay? Are order one to 10. And uh, so you have one parameter gamma, one parameter is n, that is how quickly this thing is changing, and one parameter is the Hubble parameter. You write an equation of motion for the mode functions of the gauge field, and you get both of terms, you know? This is the term I was mentioning in the first part of my talk, it's elicity dependent, sigma now is elicity, there is the psi here, and there is this term here that depends on n. At intermediate scales, this dominate. So basically what happens is when a mode leaves the horizon, the left-handed gets amplified by e to the psi, the right-handed doesn't do anything. And then after the mode is uh, outside of the horizon, this term dominates and determines what's going to be the slope of the mode. So how quickly the mode is going to shift away. And, uh, okay. So as in the previous case, these vector modes induce tensor modes. Uh, and this is the power of tensor modes that has the usual form that we have seen before with a number here that depends on n. n is the spectral index. n is that term here, right, here, that determines the spectral index of the electric and magnetic field. And to have an idea, n equal to minus two corresponds to a scale invariant electric field. And remember, magnetic field is always more blue than magnetic. So you see when n is equal to minus two, this plot goes from minus, almost minus two to zero. When n is equal to zero, I go back to the first part of my talk, it was just phi ff tilde. For n equal to minus two, the amount of gravitational waves diverges. And the reason is that when n is equal to minus two, the electric field is scale invariant, and so you have all the infrared modes of the electric field that had an infinite amount of time to produce gravitational waves. So I am constrained to have n larger than minus two and smaller than zero. I mean, could even be larger than zero, but it's just not interesting phenomenologically. So you have the theory with three parameters, n, psi, and h. One can try them, one of them for the tensor to scalar ratio, assuming that these guys are the main, uh, the main origin of tensors that don't have to be. Uh, I assume for R in the next plot, the suggestive value of R equal to 0.2, just because I took the plots from the paper that was July last year when bicep was in full swing. Um, uh, one accounts for inverse cascade and one finds this final result. Uh, so this is for R equal to two. Remember I had two bounds for magnetic fields. One was from galaxies and one was from blazers. The blazers one by now is taken more seriously because it seems to be more primordial. And so you don't have all the unknowns of the galactic dynamics that amplifies the magnetic field. Um, so as a function of n, this is the value of the energy scale during inflation needed to produce a magnetic field at the blazer scale of 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 17, 10 to minus 16 Gauss. And as you see, in all cases, we need to have in a scale of inflation that is kind of low but it's not ridiculously low. It's not one mega electron volt. But it's in the TV, TV to intermediate energy scale, more or less. This is, for comparison, this is for R equal to 0.2. This is for R equal to 10 to minus four for comparison. This line goes here when R is equal to 10 to minus four. So it goes down. But again, this is not so, so important. The other thing that is, is the magnetic fields at galactic scale. This is much more, you know, the requirements, phenomenological requirements are much less clear. Somebody says that you need 10 to minus 23 Gauss at one megaparsec scale, 10 to minus 21 at one megaparsec scale. In any case, for the values of the magnetic field for the blazers here, we get these values at galactic scale. So let's say if n is equal to like point minus point, minus 1.7, minus 1.8, you are in the 10 to minus 20 Gauss 
in the galactic uh, regime before it's amplified by the dynamo. And uh, in that regime, you are here, and so you have an energy scale of inflation that is about 10 to 6 to 10 to 7 to 10 to 8 GV. And to sum up, for n equal to about minus 0.07 and an energy scale of inflation 10 to 6 to 10 to 8, 10 to 9 GV, one can get magnetic fields in agreement with observations, theoretically consistent, no strong coupling, etc. Um, and how much time do I have? Conclusion. Thank you.